It started out in the Waverly Hall. Started down there in the Waverly Hall. Started out there in the Waverly Hall. We had a drink and then we had a hell of a ball. Took our blues around the whole of Southland. Took our blues around the whole of Southland. Took a blues around that whole south there. Now look out, the unknown blues, they're back again. The unknown blues story could very well start here at Invercargill Airport back in 1965. I decided I was coming out here to greet the Rolling Stones. The plane arrived, Roy Orbison gets off, the Stones get off, there's no one here but me and Mum and a couple of other people to meet the commercial flight. Mother walks up, Mick, Mick, get over here. My little boy David drives me mad, he plays your records day and night, so she dutifully brings Keith Richards, Brian Jones, all these incredibly hip people all over to meet her uh, incredibly embarrassed son. By about the November of that year, just before my 16th birthday, I went to the incinerator in the backyard took off my uniform, burnt it, and decided I wasn't going back to school and I was going to form a rock and roll band, and that was the Unknown Blues. I can imagine how, what it would have been like in the mid-60s in Invercargill. That would have must have been pretty dire for a teenager. In them days, there was nothing, you know. We were, we were living in this town with, with, you know, like farmers. There was no entertainment whatsoever, really. Invercargill was actually known as sort of bluff, the end of the world. And we'd never dreamed that um, a, a good band would come out of there. Put yourself in the same picture as the Unknown Blues. Say you were a young chap growing up in a small country town. It's cold, wet and miserable hole actually. There's not much to do. There's nowhere really to go. Uh, what would you do for entertainment, you know? Would you create it yourself? Would you just sit around home bored or would you just escape, go somewhere else? I will always remember Keith Richards saying, how the fuck can you stand living here? What do you do? <laughs> there was a lot of pop and then there was the Stones and the Stones were great, but then the Pretty Things came along and they out-stoned the Stones. There'd been all this press, they set fire to the theatre in New Plymouth, they did this, do that, and I mean, the, the excitement was rising, as was the press coverage, which just made us, we couldn't wait. The Prince jumped up the back and he was on the drums, he jumped off the drums and, and he lit newspapers on fire and he's running around and had the whole bloody stage burning and uh, that was unbelievable. You know, the Beatles songs, I want to hold your hand, cute, you know, and you know, the Stones were even quite I used to love it, but it's all over now, but I'll never forget Don't Bring Me Down. Mm. And you know, you're just at the right age at 14 or 15 to hear a lyric like, and then I laid her on the ground, my head was spinning round, you know, and that's, that's the pretty things. And, yeah. and hey, mama, keep your big mouth shut. And they were just right out there. That really got me going, mate. They said, I want to do that. <laughs> and we did that. And Hoagie was the same, you see. Up in Dipton, there wasn't, you know, a general store was about five miles away. So I thought Invercargill was a real big city, but seeing this stuff at age 14, I, I was ready to dive in the deep end and see if I could take it a bit further. <laughs> I guess it gave him a license to just misbehave. And what else is there to do in Invercargill but misbehave? I mean, it must not always been Tim Shadwell. Hey.
just like a Southland Swede. I'm so proud to be from here. I'm like a Southland Swede. A little bit tough on the outside, but when you get in there, I'm oh so sweet. Rock and roll, baby! Yeah, well, this is my garage and uh, some of my 39 parts that I've been collecting since I was a kid. I'm on my fourth motor now on it and uh, hopefully I'll wear out another couple. <laughs> I love the sound of them and I love the, the feel of them. They steer good, they ride good, sound good. They're just beautiful cars. What else would you like to know? I left home when I was 14, I pleased myself all my life, even when I was a kid. Nobody told me what to do and they still don't. I'm just lucky to have got through life without being locked. I got locked up a few times in different places, but I was never bad, just growing up, that's all. A Samoan fellow called Tony taught me to, to do the, the Samoan strum. That's sort of how I play the guitar. I was a three chord man then, and I'm still a three chord man. Like that. <laughs> when I was a little boy, I used to read war comics. And it always struck me that the Germans were always losing. My mum's maiden name was von Tunzelmann, and they were of a German background. And uh, I thought that they're just the same as anybody else. I looked at German people I knew, and none of them had square heads. They all seemed to be just the same, you know. I got interested in collecting medals when I was about 10. A few old veterans that I worked with gave me bits and pieces. So um, I had a little bit of a collection. Well, this here is the old bedroom that I used to live in. After my uh, father died, I moved out into this room here. And, uh, and this room here is where the Unknown Blues first ever had a little play together. And, uh, you know, as we all sort of talked about, you know, things that we'd like to do and drunk beer and uh, fantasised about being blues rock musicians, uh, you know, that's the room where it all really first started. They were the best days of my life, mate, yeah. I mean, a lot of people never had that uh, experience that we had. I mean, it was, most people just go through a humdrum sort of ordinary old, you know, youth and, you know, do the normal things. But, mate, us guys, we, bloody, we lived life to the excess and, and we done things that were, for their time, new, you know. And, uh, and naturally, I, I think about it every now and then is because it was special, you know. When the Unknown Blues started, this was my harmonica. I'd get home from school every night, play this in the key of G, along with Stones, Yardbirds, records, everything. Finding notes that work, all in the wrong key. So when I met Vaughan Mackay, he said, nah, when I'm an A, you need a D harp, you know, E or an A, and I picked up one of these and went, straight away because I've been practicing on the wrong thing for about a year but I'd got it down. <laughs> when the Unknown Blues started, entertainment was in coffee bars and in halls that are just typical of this that are right throughout the country. They were a hangover from the days where you'd go to a dance and you'd get supper, you know, like a cup of tea and bring a plate. The guy who was running the show was a minister and we were pretty loud and <laughs> tried to imitate the bands we'd seen down at the Civic Theatre and uh, he came up and uh, told us, look, you're too loud. And I think we more or less said, well, you can get nicked and wound it up a bit more and carried on. Used, though, was it? <laughs> no, he used an old Saxon word. <laughs> the other groups were into the technical side of rock and roll and all the other groups in Invercargill, all they wanted to do was copy what they heard on the radio and they wanted to copy it note for note and be as perfect as they could be. 
as it sounded on the radio. So well, they all, you know, used to wear suits and little bow ties and play the Beatles and, you know, nice music, sit down up there all together and two foot apart, you know, and la 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 la. All these bands sprung up playing Beatles music and Beach Boys and Hollies and all this kind of stuff, but Dave, he started going up to Christchurch and visiting clubs like the Stage Door and rubbing shoulders with people that were doing what we would later be doing. The first time I ever saw the Unknown Blues, we were just getting around on a Saturday night and we heard of this wild and raucous group. They were very loud on the bass and they were playing the kind of alternative music that I really liked at the time. Phil, like myself, couldn't play an instrument, you see. He wasn't taught and, he, yes. And then Wombi came along and he was a professional drummer, been playing for years with these other bands and he was good. And of course that helped me, being the, the rhythm, like the bass section is a rhythm, because I had something to follow then and as today I have the same thing. Rocket was still learning and he could sort of play bass guitar and he can still sort of play the bass guitar. We loved them because they were totally raw. They were sort of doing four chords, pretty thing stuff, and that was it. But they really did it. They did it with verve. It was delivered extremely well. We used to really let a rip, mate. We didn't really care whether we were out of key or <laughs> whatever. We just really went hard at it. There was nothing quite like us. You know, and that's not a bragging thing. They just nobody looked like us. No one was doing the material we were doing. We weren't just doing pretty things and stones. I was getting stuff. You know, we were doing some early soul and Motown songs in amongst it all as well. The whole band worked because the rhythm section was good, and Hoagie was delivering a, a good show up front, and Vaughan was getting the licks out. So the the whole machine worked and look good. We played a lot of 12 bar music and I just like 12 bar music. I don't like pop songs, the stuff that other people play. I just like the 12 bar blues side of it. It's got feeling, not like pop music. It hasn't got no feeling. You can't bang your foot to it. <laughs> I like to bang my foot to it. <laughs>
Do you know I have trouble remembering what I did last week? You want to remember what I did 40 years ago? It was different in those days. Things were, things were a lot different. We just had parties and rode motorbikes. Basically. We were riding around for, for a couple of years or so and we decided we'd get a patch, to have a patch. So someone came up with the, uh, with the idea we'd be the Antarctic Angels because it will be the most southern motorcycle club we reckoned in the in the in the, in New Zealand or in the world probably. So we that's how the Antarctic Angels come about the name. Oh, they're just a good bunch of guys. That's all, you know, just good party going guys. There was Skunk and Fox and Roy. Yeah, it was just a good good bunch of guys. Good party drinking and bloody yahooing and carrying on. And there was no trouble or anything with them, or very little. They like good hard rocking music, they like drinking alcohol and they like girls and so we all, you know, so between us and them it was quite a community of rockers, you know. We loved the idea that we had Antarctic Angels, a bikey gang further south than Dunedin, who would have thought it? Hunter S. Thompson's book on um the Hells Angels, you know, Sonny Barger and all those guys. That was handed around our whole circle. The guys read that book and said, we'll form a little bike club down here. Now, they had no affiliation, I emphasise, with the American Hells Angels or Australian or Auckland ones. And it's the rocker at the top, the MC and then the cargo at the bottom. Everyone was different. That's all we wore over the top of a leather jacket, I suppose. The rockers and everything are the same, but it, what, it, what anyone done to their jacket is their thing, you know, their personal thing. Yeah, I was probably scruffy, for want of a better term, <laughs> but, uh, but I never thought, thought of myself as scruffy, I just was me, you know, that's the way I was, and I couldn't be really bothered what anyone else thought, it didn't worry me. You know, they, they could go and get stuffed. In those days, you know, nobody could afford uh, leather trousers, all that type of, you know, stuff and that, so we everyone just wore um, seamless jerseys, black trousers, gum boots. You just grabbed a beanie and pulled a beanie on, over your head and uh, mutton cloth all around your face. So the only your eyes were showing and uh, sheepskin gloves on and away we went. The Antarctic Angels were just very much like the coffin cheaters of the day. They were just people riding bikes together, having a good time. Our influences were very much through the English books they started doing the bodgy, woodgy thing with the hair and the, and the pointed toe shoes, then they got onto bikes. That type of thing, I think, started to influence the people getting together as a wee bit of a club-gang. I don't think we were as, um, as organised behind the scenes as they are now. We didn't have any financial backing or, you know, we didn't generate cash or anything. You know, we, what we earned in our wages from work was the more money we had. The whole Nazi regalia type thing once again started about the same time, influenced again probably by Hells Angels, movies, books, information about gangs, uh, bike gangs overseas. And then it was all pretty cool to, if you could find an old Nazi helmet and have it chromed. It didn't mean anything. They looked mean. They were the nicest chaps going, but they looked mean, you know, had their leathers and long hair and probably in the bath for a couple of weeks and, you know, but they were the nicest blokes, really. We didn't take over joints and stuff like that. We just had a good time. Just drinking and riding. Picking up chicks. What I'm holding in my hand is probably one of only two or three left on this earth, but it's a coffin cheetah's patch. Embroidered as BBB, which is supposed to be broads, bikes and booze. But in my case, the broads went to boys. As a woman rider, um, we were treated very much as mates. Um, we were equal, pretty much equal to all the guys that were around. And there wasn't any animosity in those days and I never felt ever once threatened. We'd all meet up and have a lot of fun. Well, sometimes, you know, and that, that's when it, uh, the, police, the police used to come along with us. They used to, you know, always fight and argue over who was going to carry the sleeping bags and bloody, you know, or if it was raining, it wasn't unheard of for the police to carry the girls a little bit, you know, in the, in the van, in the, in the vehicle. 
we would see a guy somewhere, he might be anywhere, he might be standing leaning up against a, a post, he might have a bike, he might not, he might have a car. We'd just pull up and go, well, hi, how are you, you know? Well, the Antarctic Angels, I mean, they're pretty scary. I mean, this is in Bacargo in the late 60s. I mean, um, you know, when I look at some of the photos I've actually got of them, because I had some shots of them at parties, when I go back to those photos, they look, they look fairly innocent. Um, but at the time, um, they would have been, you know, you know, you know kind of an outlawry group um, um, on British motorbikes. Um, you know, mods and rockers, probably at the end of that phase in, in Britain and whatever. Um, Roy Reid was the leader of the um, um, Antarctic Angels. He was probably the closest you'd ever go to, say, a Hell's Angel in America. He was uh, sort of in charge. Yeah, he smacked me in the nose once. <laughs> I beat him at darts. What are we doing here? We're looking for Roy Reed's grave. Yeah. But uh, I'm not quite sure where it's like. It was about, it was 71, so I thought it was around here somewhere. But, uh, so it was always exciting when he was, you know, when you were out and about with Roy. It was a hard case, but, but you know, he was, he was good fun. You didn't mess with Roy. <laughs> you know, he was a four but two, if you, you know, if it was on was handy, he was that sort of boat, you know, if he was on the right frame of mind. Look at that. You know what you find there? You go looking? Blokes that were out on the edge, sort of impressed Roy. He, he, he lived like that. You know, when he arrived in a buddy into a piss up there, people stood up and took notice. Like, you know, Roy was here, there was a fucking, didn't take long for them to find out. He was a party animal, no two ways about that. And he'd get down a few, few whiskies and he'd get a, get a bit mean actually at times, got our Roy. I used to have a few scraps, but a lot of people did in those days. There was always the fighters always used to seem to come out on a Saturday night and all that. And we used to have guys come down from Gore and Dunedin to pick on the best fighter down here and all stuff like that. But Roy wasn't really into that, fighting other people, but like that just to see how good they were. But if any shit happened, yeah, Roy could handle himself quite well. We used him a little bit as a roadie when we went up to Dunedin. He'd help mm. us to carry the gear. Barry and I taught him a little bit of the guitar and uh, he even got up on stage with us on occasion and mm. played some simple rhythms with us. We came down here, there was some show on, and Roy just come in here, instead of stopping... And we buying just, a ticket at the ticket. Buying a ticket, we just rode in. 